Now, if you have gone through Shakespeare's sonnets, specially addressed to the dark lady, you would notice that he is deliberately debunking all kinds of traditional metaphors and similes. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. He is going against this Petrarchan trope of comparing women to roses, to moon, to sun, to things which are cliche, which are boring because they have been overused. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. We are doing a thorough textual reading and analysis of William Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. Today in this video we are going to look at the fourth scene of second act. We have already covered the previous scenes in details. So if you haven't watched them, please do so right after you finish watching this video. I have also discussed about the story of Twelfth Night before I started this series and I would request you to watch that although you might feel that it has a lot of spoilers because uh, there I am telling you what happens in the story. Don't skip anything in this scene because it is a very important scene especially if you are preparing for reference to context type uh, questions uh, or any short questions from this play because this is the scene from where most of the reference to context questions uh, are chosen and you need to understand the lines very carefully. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so right now so that you get notified every time we post a new video. This is Munami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. Act 2, Scene 4 is set in the court of Orsino. In previous scenes, we have been in the household of Olivia and now we are taken back to Orsino's court. As the scene opens, we see Duke Orsino, Viola, Curio, uh, the other attendant of Orsino and others. They are uh, there in the court and Duke begins again with some demand for music. Give me some music. Why this speech is important is because in the first scene of first act, we have a similar kind of scene where the Duke is asking for some music. If music be the food of love, play on. Sometimes uh, this line is given in reference to context and students can get confused. So you have to be very careful about uh, this speech, not to confuse it with the speech he says in the first scene of first act okay so these are two different things give me some music now good morrow friends now good cesario but that piece of song so he is talking about one particular song which he had heard the last day that old and antique song a song which was a bit old fashioned okay we heard last night me thought it did relieve my passion much. So the Duke feels that it was Cesario who sang that song last night. He wants Cesario to sing it again. Me thought it did relieve my passion much. So I was feeling very emotional and that song kind of matched with my passion and I felt relieved. More than light airs and recollected terms of these most brisk and giddy paced times. So these are the times when the mind gets charged, the mind gets giddy, confused uh, and I can't make sense of most things. These are the times when uh, music like that relieves me. So he feels that he needs to hear it once more. Come, but one verse. Curio interrupts. He is not here. So Curio says that the person who sang that song was not Cesario but somebody else. He is not here. So please your lordship that should sing it. Who was it? Feste the jester. Now we know the name of the jester okay, or the fool whom we have already met in previous scenes. 
Feste, the jester, my lord, a fool that the lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He is about the house. So he is near about the place. Now uh, we can call him. Seek him out and play the tune the while. So before he comes, set the mood, starts playing the musical instruments so that when he comes, he can start singing with that background score. Curio goes away. We have background music on stage. And it appears to be a very uh, melodious tune, old-fashioned tune, uh, a little bit of a melancholic tune. So it's a beautiful moment that is created on stage. The Duke is sitting with Cesario, our Viola, dressed as a boy. The Duke calls her, come hither boy, and then he says something almost philosophical. If ever thou shalt love, if you ever fall in love, in the sweet pangs of it, remember me. When you fall in love, you start suffering for your beloved. In those moments, remember me. Why does he want his attendant to remember him when he falls in love? For such as I am, he is such a person all true lovers are unstayed and skittish in all motions else save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved i am like all true lovers unstable in everything else except in love except in thinking about the person i love so he is trying to uh, brag about himself that he is very steadfast and he is very loyal uh, to Olivia or to his love for him, Olivia and in other things he is skittish, he is unstained, he is unstable and you can't depend on him but in love he is constant. So he should be remembered every time somebody falls in love. How dost thou like this tune? So he is talking about the music. Now I want to pause and want you to think about the last thing he said that he is unstable in all other motions which means you can't depend on him for making decisions as a duke uh, in making decisions of business uh, about other things of life but you can depend on him that he will love only and only Olivia. We will see that this person is rather inconstant in love and constant in other things. He is an extremely good administrator, very wise duke. Only when it comes to love, he is not constant at least. So this is a very ironic statement that he makes. He just wants to make sure that his very, very uh, beautiful attendant, Cesario, appreciates him and he says that. It gives a very echo to the seat where love is throned. That's a very beautiful way of saying that this tune is a reflection of a lover's heart. It's a very romantic tune. Thou dost speak masterly. You're very well versed. You have said very beautifully. My life upon it, young though thou art, you are a very young person. Thine eye hath stayed upon some favor that it loves. The way you understand how this music matches with a loving heart, I can feel that you have already fallen in love with someone. Okay. You are a very young person, too young to fall in love because judging from the looks of Cesario with no moustache and all, Duke had a feeling that his age is very tender. So it's, it's not natural that he would fall in love or know about love. Okay, so he feels surprised and at the same time he thinks that this person knows about love. So he says that, I'm sure you have already fallen in love with someone. A little by your favor. <laughs> of course, Viola has fallen in love. Fallen in love with Orsino himself. So she has fallen in love by the favor of Orsino because she has fallen in love with Orsino. What kind of woman is it of your complexion? 
So, when the Duke asks, what kind of woman did you fall in love with? Then, of course, Viola is saying something which can be taken as a white lie. White lie means not completely lie, not completely true. She is saying that the person is of your complexion, matches you. She is not worth the then what? Yours in fate. So, Duke thinks that uh, of his complexion means as old as he is. Of course, the Duke is uh, older. Uh, than Cesario or Viola uh, and it is commonly taken that women uh, should marry or fall in love with uh, men who are older than them and men should choose women who are younger than them. God knows what logic is there uh, but there is this idea that uh, women uh, mature quicker than men and therefore uh, it is not advisable for men to choose women who are older than them. That is the traditional uh, way of thinking about these things. Okay, this is what the Duke is talking about. She is not worthy then. What years in faith? About your years, my lord. So the age is about your age. Too old, by heaven. Let still the woman take an elder than herself, whoever this woman is. She should choose somebody who is older than her. So, wears she to him? So, wears she to him means uh, she adapts to him. She adjusts to him. Okay, that's a good match if the woman is of a younger age than the man. So, sways she level. That is the uh, proper way of maintaining a level, a balance in her husband's heart. So, there is there's an equilibrium if the woman is younger. So, your uh, beloved, since she is older than you, uh, she should rather choose somebody who matches this criteria. For boy, however, we do praise ourselves. Now, why does he say this? He is really making a very funny statement here. Earlier he was saying that he is skittish or he is unstable in all motions except in love. Now focus on what he is saying. However we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm. We are not constant when we love someone. Uh, yeah, just now you said that you are very constant in your love. Now you are saying you are giddy and unfirm in your love. More longing, wavering, sooner lost and worn than women's are. So, men's love changes. Therefore, you should, uh, you should always choose somebody who will stay young and beautiful for a longer period of time. A strange kind of patriarchal logic is in that. We seem to like or see less and less as we go. I don't know how Viola has really fallen in love with this guy. I think it well, my lord. Viola says that, yes, I also think what you are saying is true. Then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affection cannot hold the bent. Bent means strain, moments when, you know, in every relationship there are moments when it is very tense. These are the moments when love is tested. That is referred to as the bent. So, if the woman is young, beautiful, then no matter what tensions come, uh, men can ignore them and the relationship stays. This is his logic again. For women are as roses, whose fair flower being once displayed doth fall that very hour. Women are as roses if they are displayed, which means that when they are buds, not opened yet, they look beautiful. And just when they open up, when you actually see the rose, it is very momentary because it falls off, it, it destroys itself. Okay, So, that is what the flavor of women is. Now, this is also a very patriarchal thing which he is saying. He is judging women only based on appearances. But we have to understand that this play was written uh, like long back and 
At the same time, we also have to remember that this is one character's point of view. This is not Shakespeare's point of view. Perhaps this is Shakespeare's way of telling us about different ways of looking at women. Because unless and until different ways are put in front of us, we cannot understand which is patriarchal, which is not. So when he says that women are as roses, then he says that being a rose is a compliment. Now, if you have gone through Shakespeare's sonnets, especially addressed to the dark lady, you would notice that he is deliberately debunking all kinds of traditional metaphors and similes. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. He is going against this Petrarchan trope of comparing women to roses, to moon, to sun, to things which are cliche, which are boring because they have been overused. Orsino is that kind of a lover. He is a Petrarchan lover. You know, his lady love is more beautiful because she is unattainable. And somehow Shakespeare wants to present to us a character who has a fault. And this is a fault. We will see how Viola will correct this fault. How his little mistake in judging women, little mistake in the sense that he is judging women on wrong parameters. This will be corrected when the play ends. And that is the point of this play. So Orsino, totally confused. Once he is saying that men are constant, once he is saying that women are constant, then he says women are as roses. And then Vahala says, and so they are, alas, that they are so, to die even when they to perfection grow. So yes, the moment we, uh, we bloom is the moment our youth is gone. And it's a pity that she is not saying we, of course, because she doesn't want uh, to expose herself. She is saying they. So it's a pity that uh, women are valued only on the basis of being a rose. Anyway, so now Curio enters with Feste. Oh fellow, come, the song we had last night. Mark it, Cesario. It is old and plain. The spinsters and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their thread with bones do use to chant it. So it's like a folk song. And he is giving an introduction to the song. It's a folk song uh, which has a beauty about it, which has a melody about it. It is silly, so I know it's 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 not very deep philosophy, it's common man's language. And dallies with the innocence of love, like the old age. So he is showing his nostalgic nature, and this song makes him think about his uh, younger days. Feste wants to sing, he says, Are you ready, sir? I pretty sing. And the clown sings. This is the second song by Feste in the play. Come away, come away, death, and in sad cypress let me be laid. Fire away, fire away, breath, I am slain by a fair cruel maid. So this is a melancholic song, a sad song, because a person has fallen in love uh, with a woman and that love is not returned and therefore this person wants to die and is courting death, is inviting death and saying that I want to lie in a coffin made of cypress wood. So he is saying in sad cypress let me be laid. So let me be laid inside a coffin made of cypress wood. Fire away, fire away breath, I am slain by a fair cruel maid. So now he wants his breath to go away because he is killed by a beautiful woman. My shroud of white stuck all with you, O oh, prepare it. My part of death, no one so true did share it. He wants his death cloth, something you wrap the body with, uh, to be made with sticks of you. You is also a very a uh, common metaphor of a sad tree, you know, it, you have yew trees 
uh, near places where people are buried. Not a flower, not a flower sweet, on my black coffin let there be strewn. I don't want anybody to mark the place with flowers after I am buried. Not a friend, not a friend greet my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown. I don't want anybody to come and mourn me. A thousand, thousand sighs to save, lay me aware. Sad true lover never find my grave to weep there. Don't bury me where people can come and recognize my grave and weep. I don't want anybody's tears. So somehow uh, he wants to be away from everybody's grief when he is away from this world. And this is kind of a contrast with the way Orsino speaks. Orsino wants to be remembered. Okay, he's saying that when you fall in love with somebody, remember me. Or Sino says that I am different from everybody else. So he celebrates being him. And this lover wants oblivion, wants to be forgotten. Because he thinks that there's no point in being remembered if you do not get your love. The Duke is thoroughly impressed, he gives him some money. There is for thy pains. So this is a prize. No pains, sir. I take pleasure in singing, sir. So we know that Feste has a, a good uh, way of uh, playing with words and he uses that. I'll pay thy pleasure then. So, okay. Truly, sir, and pleasure will be paid. <laughs> now, this is a very common saying that pleasure will be paid means when you have any kind of pleasure in life, you need to make a payment for it which means nothing in this world comes free. And especially uh, it refers to those pleasures which are pleasures of the flesh, uh, pleasures which have no regard for morality. So if you indulge in those pleasures, then you have to pay the price. Now this is of course uh, very, very unrelated to uh, the pleasure which uh, Duke is talking about here. But again, first day is first day. He will always play with words. One time or another. Give me now leave to leave thee. So now the duke have had enough and he wants the clown to leave. Now the melancholy god protect thee and the tailor make thy doublet of changeable taffeta for thy mind is a very opal. This might seem as a very vague comment that fool is making. But think about what he's actually saying. He's saying the tailor make thy doublet of changeable taffeta. He wants Orsino to wear a robe made of silk which has double colors. You know, there are some kinds of silks which reflect and give uh, different hues, different colors when light falls. So the fool is saying that your tailor should prepare for you a dress which shows multiple colors. Why? Because your mind is like an opal. Opal is a gemstone which again reflects a lot of colors, multiple colors, different shades. Does the fool mean that Orsino's mind is not fixed on someone or something? It's prone to changing like opal does he understand already that this man is not stable when it comes to emotions? But he says this as if he is giving a compliment and he says, I would have men of such constancy, inconstancy, put to see if I find somebody with your kind of temperament who is not constant at all, then I will put that person to see on a sea voyage. Why? Because usually a sea voyage is boring. You just see the sea. But if your mind is like Orsino's mind, you can imagine so many things that you can turn that sea voyage into a very rich experience. That their business might be everything and their intent everywhere. For that's it that always makes a good voyage of nothing. So the voyage might be of nothing, but it's worth it. 
if you have imagination, if you are not constant, fixed, if you are Orsino. So, Clown is making a very good judgment about Orsino's character. He is not making any value judgment. He is not saying you are bad. He is saying you are not boringly constant because being constant, even being constantly loyal is boring from one point of view. He leaves. Now, the Duke is alone with Cesario again. Let all the rest give place. So, the Duke wants some time with uh, Cesario. Once more Cesario, he wants Cesario to go to Olivia's place for once more. Get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Go to that cruel woman, that royal cruel woman. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. I am not interested in her property. The parts that fortune hath bestowed upon her, I am not interested in what inheritance she has because of her fortune, because of her, her ancestry. I don't care how much money she has. Tell her, I hold as giddily as fortune, but this, that miracle and queen of gems that nature pranks her in, attracts my soul. So what I am attracted in her is her beauty. Tell her that. I am not interested in anything else. But if she cannot love you, sir, but she is saying no, I cannot be so answered. So this guy has absolutely no idea about consent and no idea that a woman should be given the option to choose. He is saying that I will not accept no for an answer. Soon. But you must. But you should accept. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, now she is giving him an imaginary situation. That try to imagine that there is a lady, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. Suppose there was a woman who was in love with you as much as you are in love with Olivia. Of course, she is referring to herself. You cannot love her because you love Olivia. You tell her so and then you tell her, right, that I don't love you because I love Olivia. Must she not then be answered? Then you would say that, okay, you have to accept my answer. So why can't you accept Olivia's answer? Now that hurts the ego of Orsino. Woman? How can a woman love like me? There is no woman's sides can bite the beating of so strong a passion as love doth give my heart. How can a woman love the way I do? How can she hold so much passion in her heart? No woman's heart so big to hold so much. They lack retention. A woman cannot love so much. They, their capacity to love is limited. Now, few moments back, minutes back, he had said that it is the fault of men that they are not constant in love. And then few moments previous to that, he had said that he is constant only in love. So this is the most wavering kind of character we have seen, who gives three, four different versions of men and women's love within a single scene. And he says that he is constant. And he says that he knows what he is doing. They lack retention. They cannot retain love. Alas, their love may be called appetite. They are only attracted to men. They feed on this emotion as if this is appetite, hunger. No motion of the liver. Now, liver is the seat of emotion or rather passion. I am sorry. Heart is emotion, liver is passion. So women are not passionate, it's, it's surface level. That is what the Duke is saying. But the palate, so it doesn't touch their inner core. It is very superficial, the way women love. That suffers surfeit. So they are easily satisfied. And then when they are satisfied, they get bored and they become boring employment and revolt and they start hating the man with whom they have fallen in love. This is 
the Duke's idea. No wonder he's still single. But mine is all as hungry as the sea. But I am I'm not, not like a woman. I have extreme capacity for love. I receive like the sea. All emotions possible. And can digest as much. Another tricky part. This paragraph is often set by examiners or paper setters for reference to context. Why? Because it's easy to confuse this passage with the speech Orsino makes in Act 1, Scene 1, where he again refers to C. Okay? I'm saying this from my personal experience. Trust me, I made this mistake in my college internals and thank God it was internals. So I keep on telling my students, for heaven's sake, don't confuse between the two speeches of Orsino. Okay? They have the same kind of content, but they are from different scenes. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. I, but I know. What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. I know about the kind of love a woman can feel. Now, since Viola is dressed as Cesario, the Duke is confused as to how she can know about or how he can know about women's love. So she has to justify her statement and she says, In faith they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter loved a man. My father had a daughter, which means I had a sister. Okay. But we know the truth that she is talking about herself. But the Duke thinks Viola or Cesario is talking about his sister, my father's daughter, which means my sister. Okay. My father had a daughter, loved a man, as it might be perhaps, were I a woman, I should your lordship. Uh, I mean, she loved him so much, just like I would have loved you if I were a woman. So, well, and what's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment, this hiding of love, like a worm in the bud, feed on her damask cheek. Her, her damask cheek, her rosy, uh, fair cheek. Her fairness, all, all gone. She was eaten from inside because she could not tell her love. She is, of course, talking about herself. She pined in thought, and with a green and yellow melancholy, she sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. So that ultimate picture of sadness, of unrequited love. Thus of this love indeed. We men may say more, swear more, but indeed, our shows are more than will, for still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. Now, Viola hits back because she has been hearing uh, long enough against women. And now she has to speak back and she says that men, they swear much, they promise much, but it is women who do much when they are in love. The Duke is very interested in that sister. But died thy sister of her love, my boy? I am all the daughters of my father's house. This means, yes, my sister died. But we know this means that I am that woman. Because it is Viola. I am all the daughters of my father's house and all the brothers too. And yet I know not. And when the Duke is totally confused about what this boy is saying, she changes the topic. Sir, shall I to this lady? I. that's the theme. Okay, let's come back to the point. So now the Duke is again in line. To her in haste, give her this jewel. So he gives him a piece of jewelry. Say, my love can give no place, bide no dine. So look, tell her, that I'm not ready to accept any denial. I'm not ready to listen to any kind of refusal. 
you will have to have to convince her and he asks her to leave and well she leaves so what we are left with is a thought that what kind of uh, relationship is viola expecting with this man she knows that this man is not stable but she also understands that his lack of stability is possibly because of his lack of experience with women. Probably he never had a girlfriend. We don't know about that. Probably he never had any uh, role model in front of him when relationships are concerned. Uh, maybe his parents had this kind of boring relationship. So he grew up knowing that uh, women are like this, men are like that. So he has this uh, boxed thinking in his mind. He is completely traditional and boringly uh, cliched in the way he is looking at men and women. Uh, he is not thinking about the possibility of any shade in men and women. So Viola possibly has this faith that once he uh, has real experience with a woman, when he really sees a woman, he would know what a woman is and somehow see we might uh, see Orsino as an unstable person but we will come to see much later in the play that when he is acting as a duke he is very very uh, wise and uh, has great discretion those are the qualities for which Orsino was famous Viola had known about him even before she arrived here so it's possible that there are qualities in Orsino which Shakespeare chooses to not show us apparently openly on stage. Qualities which Viola gets to understand more and more as she is being with him now, very close with him. So her love for him is genuine, justified and proper. We might question it because we don't know what exactly she knows about Orsino and we have so much faith in Viola because somehow we feel that she is the epitome of fairness, of proper insight and mental stability. She is the benchmark. So if she has chosen this man, this man must be worthy enough. All right, so let's just move on from this scene to the next one. In the next video, we will cover that. In the next scene, we will go back to Olivia's house and have a very, very funny episode where Malvolio will become the butt of ridicule and will play in a very foolish manner. That will be a hilarious scene. Don't miss that scene when we upload it. And those of you whose universities have declared that your exams will be in offline mode, don't get scared. Uh, the examiners are human beings. We teachers, we know what you have been through. So have faith in us. Write what you know. We will give you marks. We promise you that. Okay. So don't feel afraid because sometime you need to come out of that coma, right? Online mode is like a coma. We are always there for you. As teachers, we commit that we will not let you suffer unduly. Have some faith. Okay, so it's just, just an appeal to everybody to shake off this fear of on-campus offline exams. Because exams are not things to punish you. Exams are things to make you feel that you know it after all. So see you all in my next video. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Lots of blessings, especially for this exam season. Stay happy. Stay subscribed. Bye-bye.